Bible to the book of 1 Samuel this morning. I'm going to show you the picture of a good looking man. Have y'all ever seen a good looking man? You wives just turn to look at your husband. All right, enough said about that. There he is. Does anybody recognize him? That is our former president, Andrew Jackson. They called him Old Hickory. There's a reason why I'm mentioning him this morning in this message. Andrew Jackson loved his mother. She was the most profound influence on his life growing up. His father had died when he was very young. And while he was still a young man, his mother died. In her, in a, in her last conversation with Andrew Jackson before she died, this is what she said. She gave him some advice that never left him. He said, my mother's last words to me have been the guiding principle of my life. Do you want to see what she said? This is what she said. In this world, you will have to make your own way. Your daddy's gone. Your mama's going to be gone. You have to make your own way. To do that, you must have friends. Now, that is a very profound Statement. It's a very simple statement, but I believe Mrs. Jackson was right. Everybody needs friends. Whether you're the general of an army or whether you're the CEO of a large corporation or the leader of a nation, you must have friends. And this is a truth that is illustrated, I think, for us in the life of one of the greatest kings who ever lived, King David. Now, we're in the middle of a series of messages on David. I've titled it after God's own heart. I think there are a great many life lessons that we can learn from David in Scripture. The Bible calls David a man after God's own heart. He's the only man in Scripture that is said of that. And our scripture passage we're going to read in just a moment this morning, it describes a friendship that is without question one of the most famous friendships in history, and it is the greatest friendship ever revealed in the Bible. It's the story of the friendship of David and Jonathan. Now, I want you to understand this morning, Jonathan was not just a friend to David. I believe he was David's best friend. And Jonathan's friendship was so valuable because when you read the story of David, you realize not only would David never have become king without Jonathan, he would have never survived without Jonathan. David, in a sense, I think, owed both his throne and his life to Jonathan. There's a saying that I remember from my days in the low country of South Carolina. There's some wonderful people down there. I learned a lot in my time there. Does anybody recognize that picture? That's exactly what you think it is. That's a turtle sitting on a fence post. Now, the saying I learned in the low country of South Carolina, if you ever see a turtle on the top of a fence post, you know that he didn't get there by himself. Let me say that one more time. You're looking at me like you didn't get it. If you ever see a turtle on top of a fence post, you know that he didn't get there by himself. Now let me say this about that. Anybody who has ever gotten anywhere has had the friend people to help him get there, whether he realizes it or not. Now, I know today we all have dealings with people who are not really interested in becoming our friend. I meet people every day in passing. They don't know me. I don't know them. I generally speak to everybody. It scares people to death. When you look folks in the eye and you speak, it's like, whoa. Oh, some of y'all remember Otis Thomas? <laughs> Otis was a good friend. I thank the Lord for Otis. He meant a lot to me. But I, I, when I'm out, I just speak to people. And uh, one guy, he, he took a look at me, and he stepped back, and he, I thought he was going to run. And I said, Otis, what's the matter? He's scared of you. 
You know, people are not used to you talking to them in the world we live in now. They think, boy, you, 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 you got something. Isn't that sad? I think it's just terribly sad. One of the best examples of my life as a young man was a gentleman that I used to work for, Mr. Charlie. I worked at the grocery store down in Royston. I worked at the New Deal. I still call it the New Deal. I think it was built in 1972, 1973, but that's, it was new to me. Anyway, Mr. Charlie, everybody that walked in that door, he spoke to them, called them by name. I remember what he told me one day. I was helping him bag produce. I think it was bagging potatoes. And somebody walked by, and uh, he saw him coming, and he walked out the door to speak to him. And he came back in just a minute later, and he said, Paul, did you see that person? Yeah. He said, I have a store because they walked in the door. And they walk in the door. I'm going to speak to them. I'm going to learn their name. I'm going to ask them if there's anything I can help them find. And if they want something, I'll have it. I'll tell them it'll be here next week. He said, you take care of people, and people will always be there for you. That was the best example for a young man. I mean, all of my education in college, all the things that I learned when I went off to school, nothing compared to what I learned from him about dealing with people. You and me need to learn a lesson about friendship. There's two things true for every one of us this morning. Let's see if I can get this thing to turn quick. There it is. Two things true for every one of us. We all need to have the right kind of friend. Would you agree with that? Then number two, we all need to be the right kind of friend. We all meet many people in life, but we won't make many best friends. So I want to encourage you this morning, choose your friends wisely. What we're talking about today, I think, is important. I think this is something that you need to teach your children. I think it's something that you need to teach your grandchildren. There's three things, three choices that we make that are vitally important. The choice number one, which God am I going to serve? What did jo Joshua say? Joshua says, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Number one, the first choice, which God am I going to serve? Number two, what person am I going to marry? Number three, who are going to be my best friends? Now, you can make choices about a lot of things in life. You make choices about what clothes you're going to wear. You make choices about what vehicle you're going to drive. You make choices about what you're going to eat. Okay, you make choices every day. Most of those choices are not life and death choices, but three, these three choices here, your whole life depends upon making the right choice in those three areas. So look at our scripture this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war. And he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servant. This morning, I want to show you from the word of God what it takes to have the best friend and be the best friend. What made Jonathan the best friend of David. Three principles principles I want you to discover with me in the Word of God today. The first principle is a good friend will always give selfless love. 
1 Samuel chapter 18 verse 1 tells you pretty much all you need to know as to why Jonathan was David's best friend. Look back at verse 1. We read it just a moment ago. It says that when he had finished speaking to Saul, the Saul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. The word knit there literally means in the original Hebrew language to be chained. Literally, that verse says the soul of Jonathan was chained to the soul of David. Jonathan and David were one in spirit. They were one in heart. They were more than just friends. They're what you and I would call today soul brother. Jonathan had the highest love for David that a person could have because he loved him as his own soul. Think about that. Do you know what that means? It means this. Jonathan loved David as much as Jonathan loved Jonathan. Do you remember what Jesus said was the second greatest commandment of all? You remember the first commandment? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He said, the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now stop and think about that. That's easy to say, but it's not so easy to do, is it? We all tend to love ourselves more than we love anyone else, don't we? I get myself up in the morning. I drink my coffee. I eat my breakfast. I go make myself presentable. Now, I'm just going to tell you, I do the best I can with what I have to work with. You should see me when I get out of bed. <laughs> my wife sees that. Oh, my goodness. Do y'all have a comfortable shirt you like to sleep in? I have a shirt that I like to sleep in at night. It's old. It's very old. But it's very comfortable. It's very soft. And every week it gets more holes in it. And Debbie tells me, she said, if somebody were to knock on the door, you ask them the door, hey, what would they think? Well, I, I think I'd go get another shirt if somebody knocked on my door. <laughs> But she tells me, I'm going to throw that shirt away. That's what she did with my last shirt that I slept in. I had a Barney Five shirt. <laughs> Barney Five, security by five. That was my favorite shirt. I love that shirt. I slept in that shirt every night until she threw it away. And this shirt that I sleep in now is a gone fishing shirt. I love it. I don't ever get to fish, but I like the shirt. <laughs> oh, but hey. We take care of ourselves, don't we? We take care of ourselves. We see about ourselves. What this verse is saying, what Jesus says, you love your neighbor as you love yourself. You love your neighbor just as much as you love you. You do for them just what you would do for yourself. Now, it's easier for us to love ourselves more than we love somebody else. Isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, Jonathan... The Bible says he loved David as much as he loved himself. Now, how do we know that? Jonathan was the oldest son of Saul. Saul was the king. Jonathan was the heir apparent to the king. He was the prince in waiting. The royal position by birth would naturally belong to him. The people's praise should have been his. Kingly power was Jonathan's birthright. But God had promised the kingship to an unknown shepherd boy named David. Rightly, Jonathan had every reason to be envious. He had every reason to be jealous, to be bitter. But notice what he does for David. Look at verse 4. What did he do? Look at verse 4. Jonathan took off the robe that was on him, and he gave it to David with his armor, even his sword and his bow and his belt. Jonathan gave David his robe, which was a symbol of his future role as a king. Jonathan gave David his sword and his bow, which symbolized his role as the commander-in-chief. Jonathan even gave David his belt, which was the chief uh, ornament of a soldier. In other words, what Jonathan did, he gave everything that rightfully and legally belonged to Jonathan. He, he gave it all to David. 
It's amazing, isn't it? What that shows me is he had a selfless love for David. Later, there was a moment in David's life when he was under the gun and he was on the run. Saul had a hit squad after him. He was running for his life. Listen to what Jonathan says to David in 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 4. Jot that reference down. Look it up later. Jonathan said to David, whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you. Whatever you desire for me to do, I'll do for you. How many of us have someone in our life like that? How many of us need someone like that? I, I think we all do. Now, most people in our life will say, whatever you want me to do for you, I'll do if it doesn't cost me too much. Whatever you want me to do for you, I'll do if it doesn't involve money. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you if it's not inconvenient for me. Whatever you want me to do for you, I'll do if it doesn't interrupt my schedule. I think all of us put conditions on that. But Jonathan's offer was unconditional because Jonathan had a selfless love for David. Hear me this morning. There are friends and there are family. Or there is family, but then there are friends who become family. Jonathan made David a part of his family. How? By selfless love. A good friend will always give selfless love. Then let me tell you the second principle. A good friend will always give steadfast loyalty. Is loyalty a good word? I think it is. I thought about this. Tell me if you don't think this is right. I, I think this is true. Love is the foundation of any real friendship. But loyalty is the glue that holds it together. I think that's the way it works. What happened with Jonathan and David? They were committed to one another. Look at verse 3. Jonathan and David made a covenant. A covenant because he loved him as his own soul. I think David told Jonathan about his anointing by Samuel, God's prophet, to be the king of Israel. That was God's choice. And when Jonathan gave his official garments and his armor to David, making him a friend and an equal, Jonathan was acknowledged that, acknowledging that David would one day be the king. David was going to take what would have been Jonathan's place. And it was Jonathan's gift that sealed this covenant between the two of them. Now you read on, these two friends covenanted together that when David became king, Jonathan would be second in command, leading the army. And then David covenanted to protect Jonathan's family from being slain. Now think about the friendship that Jonathan shared with David. It was a costly friendship for Jonathan. Wasn't easy. Why? Because Jonathan's father, King Saul, was jealous of David. King Saul felt threatened and he felt uh, in fear of David. As you'll see later in David's story, through no fault of David, Saul became David's greatest enemy. Saul's number one goal was to see David dead. And for Jonathan to be David's friend, he risked not only losing his father's favor, but he would sacrifice his own royal future. Jonathan gave up a lot. And even though Jonathan would never be a king, I believe he had the heart of a king. He had what I would call the royalty of loyalty. It's illustrated in the next chapter. You read it. Chapter 19, verse 1, Saul told his son Jonathan and all his attendants to kill David. Saul had become so obsessed with killing David that he was willing to talk about it publicly and he didn't care who knew it. He even ordered Jonathan and all of his servants to become an assassination squad and to take David. And Jonathan not only warned that David to go into hiding, but he took up David's defense with his father. In 1 Samuel 19, 
The Bible says Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul his father and said to him, Let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you. And what he has done has benefited you greatly. That is the mark of a true friend. A true friend will have your back. A true friend will not talk about you when you're not around. A true friend will always give you the benefit of the doubt. Remember this. True friends will defend you publicly. Now, a true friend, if necessary, will confront you privately, but they will defend you publicly. David's son Solomon, in the book of Proverbs, wrote this. Proverbs 17, verse 17. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. You don't find out who your friends are when people are praising you. You find out who your friends are when people are criticizing you. You don't find out who your friends are in the good times. You find out who your friends are in the bad times. True friends will walk into your house when the whole world is walking out. A true friend gives you steadfast loyalty. Then there's a third principle this morning. That I want you to see. And that is a good friend will always give strength and support. Have you ever wondered what it was that drew Jonathan to David to begin with? Remember, David has just killed Goliath. Everybody in Israel knows David by name. David has become the hero of the nation. And here, Jonathan and David are meeting, I think, for the very first time. Jonathan had watched David do what no one else would do because of David's incredible trust in God and because of David's great heart for God. I think Jonathan had the same trust in God. I think he had a similar heart. If you look back in chapter 14 of this book of the Bible, four chapters earlier, Jonathan, in that chapter, decided the Philistines had bullied Israel long enough and something needed to be done. Everybody was afraid to fight the Philistines. But Jonathan had decided to go against them by himself with the same heart that David had. In verse 6 of 1 Samuel 14, the Bible says, Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. The Philistines. He said, perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Isn't that a tremendous statement? That's a statement of Jonathan's faith in God. Fear paralyzes you. Faith energizes you. What's wrong in America today? What's wrong with God's people today? I think we're paralyzed by fear. We need to be energized by faith. We look at the size of the giant. We need to look at the size of our God. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The victory is the Lord. Well, and one day, you go back and you read 1 Samuel 14. Jonathan, who was outmanned and outgunned, he killed 20 Philistines fighting the power of the God that he loved. And I think that's the reason that Jonathan and David were drawn together. They loved each other so much because they both loved God. Have you ever read the verse of Scripture that says the Spirit bears witness with our spirit? Do you know what that is? When you, when you see a person stand on their faith in God, does it minister to you? Does it touch you? I, I, it does me. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit. I can see God at work in, in, in people's life. It touches my heart. It moves my heart. I think Jonathan saw God at work in David's life. And Jonathan wasn't jealous of David. Jonathan loved David. David was a better man for knowing Jonathan. Jonathan was a better man for knowing David. Why? Because true friends, they always strengthen and encourage one another, especially in, in their walk with the Lord. Let me give you another Bible verse this morning. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17. Iron sharpens iron. 
So a man sharpened the countenance of his friend. Both of these men, Jonathan and David, were men of faith. And David has a, a positive effect on those around him. Let me ask you this question this morning. Are others encouraged and drawn closer to the Lord because of you? Does your faith challenge others? Does your faith encourage others? It should. Do you have a calming presence? Do you have a good influence in the lives of your family, people that you know? We'll close out. We're going to look at a scripture passage in just a moment. And we'll be done. In the last meeting between Jonathan and David, David is running like a wild animal being hunted down. God had said David would be the king, but it would be 10 years waiting for that to happen. And during those 10 years, Saul sought to take his life. David was afraid. David was exhausted. David was worried. He was running for his life during the day. He was hiding out at night. Listen to these words. This is 1 Samuel chapter 23. Look at verse 14. And David stayed in strongholds in the wilderness and remained in the mountains in the wilderness of Ziph. Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hand. So David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. And David was in the wilderness of Ziph and forest. And this is what I want you to see. This is the last thing we read about Jonathan and David in the Bible. Then Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the woods and strengthened his hand in God. That's a friend. That's the kind of friend that I need in my life. That's the kind of friend that I want to be to others. Amen? Understand, David wasn't wanted dead or alive. He was just wanted dead. Saul wanted David to be killed. And David was as human as the rest of us. I think he was fighting the very same emotions you and I would have been fighting. He was struggling with bitterness. He was struggling with anger. There's no doubt he was struggling with thoughts of revenge. I think David must have been tempted with the thought that I better kill Saul before Saul kills me. But at this point in time, what happens? Jonathan comes to David. And Jonathan strengthened his hand in God. I think Jonathan looked at David and I think he told him something like this. David, just trust in God. David, just stay close to God. Find your strength not in a sword or a shield, but find your strength in God. God's in control. God will see you through. Don't let your flesh get the better of you. Two wrongs never make a right. Did your mother ever tell you that? My mother told me that many times. Two wrongs never make a right. You never do wrong when you do what is right. When you do what God wants, you are always in the right. What did Jonathan do? Jonathan did what best friends should do. Jonathan built David up. True friends always bring out the best in you, right? True, true friends will bring you close to God. They certainly keep you from straying away from God. I like this picture. I wonder this morning if some of us need to evaluate who our friends are. When you choose your friends, Choose wisely. I've seen some people in life go down the wrong path, make the wrong decisions, and wind up in the wrong places. Do you know why? Because their best friend turned out to be their worst enemy. Choose your friends wisely. You re Remember this. It's not what you have in life that matters the most. It's who you have. The most important things in your life are not the things that you hold in your hand. No, it's what you hold in your heart. I came across a 
quote the other day that brought a smile to my face. You all have heard the saying, diamonds are a girl's best friend. Right? Listen to this quote. A best friend is everybody's diamond. I like that. A best friend is everybody's diamond. You say, preacher, what do you mean? Well, a best friend is very rare. But he's also very valuable. Amen? Everybody needs a friend. We all need a best friend. I want to tell you today about the best friend I have ever had. His name is Jesus. When Jesus invited me to be his friend, I was lost. I was an outcast. I was a sinner. I was deserving of God's wrath and God's judgment for all my and the only thing that I had to look forward to was eternal separation from God in a place called hell. But the Lord Jesus Christ, he gave his life for me on that old rugged cross. The Lord Jesus paid his blood. He shed his blood to pay the debt of my sin. All my sin. And through Jesus Christ's resurrection, he assures me that my sins can be forgiven. If I will put my faith and my trust in him. When I repented of my sin. And when I called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know what he did for me? He saved my soul. The Bible says whoever calls upon the name of the Lord. Shall be saved. Jesus Christ he forgave all my sins. He gave me a robe of righteousness. That I will wear forever. And it's all possible because of what Jesus Christ, my Savior, did for me. That is a selfless love and sacrificial love. The, Lord, the love of Jesus Christ for us, isn't it? The Lord Jesus has promised that he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. That is his steadfast loyalty to us. And the Lord Jesus has promised to guide me to holiness in this life, and then to guide me to heaven in my death. That's why Jesus Christ today is my best friend. I want you to know him. I want you to trust him too. Because I believe Jesus truly is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Today's message, that's what friends are for. Be a friend. Be the best friend of all, Jesus. I'm going to ask Sister Michelle to come. We're going to close with a hymn of invitation this morning. Before we stand to sing, every head bowed, every eye closed just for a moment. I've done my best to share with you the message that God laid upon my heart today. I think this is a message that I needed. It blessed me. As I prepared it, I pray that it has blessed you. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life today, I would invite you to call upon the Lord Jesus to trust in him. We teach our children the ABCs of salvation. A, admit that you're a sinner. B, believe that God loves you, that Jesus Christ died for you. C, Confess the Lord Jesus Christ. Call upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent of your sin. Turn to Christ. If you will do that today, he will save you. Almighty God, I pray in the quietness of this moment, as our hearts are an open book before you, that you will help us to see ourselves today as you see us. And if there be one present today that does not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life, May today be the day they would call upon Jesus and trust in Jesus. Lord, I pray today for a person who may not be where they should be in their walk with you. I pray that you might restore them to a place of fellowship and service and blessing. And then, Lord, today for a person you've spoken to their heart and challenged their heart, that they might surrender all to you. God, just have your will and way in our lives. Be honored and glorified, we pray, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me invite you to stand and sing with us together.
a hymn of invitation this morning.